All right, guys, I'm rolling. I am rolling, and I'm here with one of my really good friends, uh, Connor Boyack. Um, Kate, Connor, if if you if anyone is like familiar with the internet and is familiar with uh, libertarianism, I think is how you say it. <laughs> everyone, we will know all about Connor. Uh, but here's the thing: before we get into any of that stuff, I want you all to know that Connor's history and my history runs very, very deep, and it's very profound. Um, it actually runs uh, with uh, us being BYU roommates, actually. And Connor, you were like, what, what, how old were you? Like, you were like 21, probably. When yeah, I thought you were going to say our story goes back all the way to when you formed Dino Hand. Back were you in the part of that? Yeah, well, because you were. Listen, don't worry. That was also a thing, too. But, like, but we were roommates at, uh, at BYU. Yeah, this was like 2000, what, 2003 or four? I want to say? Yeah, it must have been. Yeah, it must have yeah. been because you... Uh, had just you were 21 I believe yeah yep and I uh, had just come home from like an LDS mission yeah and um, we were roommates in Centennial Apartments and yeah. then we also um, and it was crazy because like um, I I initially I moved into this uh, this apartment complex with like all like like these high school buddies of mine and then they all like left <laughs> and I was like dude am I just gonna stay here what am I gonna do but then and then I moved and or Connor just uh, moved in and we became like really good buddies. And I remember like every weekend we would go play volleyball. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember. In fact, I, I heard, uh, what's that Hoobastank uh, song? Oh, yeah, that was the, reason, the reason. And, yeah. Sure. I had this distinct memory that we were driving around in the car with like Misty and a couple other gals going yes. to a volleyball game, rolling down the windows, playing that Hoobastank song, just screaming our, our lungs out. That was I, I remember it was, uh, Misty, Carissa, uh, I forgot who else, but we went to Bear Lake. Do you remember? Oh, yeah, yeah. We went to Bear Lake, we rented a motorboat. It was Memorial Day weekend, and uh, um, we we were like, everyone's going to jump in the lake uh, because it's, <laughs> it's like, it's, it, was such a, it was such a stupid idea. If, if you guys have never been to Bear Lake, it's, it's a lake basically from a glacier, right? Yeah. And the water's so cold. It's, it's just walking, it hurts your feet when you're in that water. Um, and in May, it's not warm really at all. No. And uh, and the thing was, I think I, I kind of half jokingly said, okay, everyone's got to jump in. And then all of a sudden you literally jumped in. Like you literally went in and you were the first one to go in and everyone's like, like eyes wide, like, holy crap. Like he actually did it, you know? And so then I did it. And um, I, I think we all did like a couple of times, but it was so funny how quickly I was able to swim once I jumped in that water and how I got back on that, the boat. The, the follies of our youth, right? The things that now are like, no, I think I'd pass on that. I, yeah. I don't think I'll do it. yeah, I think I think I'm good. I think I'm good. But um, but yes, we were listening to Hoobah Stink, uh, there and back probably. We were like so into that song. Oh yeah, I think I think Bohemian Rhapsody was played a time or two as well. Yes, yes. Oh man, so we've had many memories, tons of fun. But um, uh, then we, you know. At the time, I was deciding to become an actor, and I started doing the acting path, and um, and you know we we kind of kept in touch. And you, I remember Connor, you always had like these incredible, profound insights regarding the Constitution and these these amazing ideas. And I was like, man, I wish I could think like that, but I just never did. And um, anyway, long story short, you have created now the the Libertas Institute. Is that correct? Is that, am I saying it correctly? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and if you guys have seen uh, things online of what, what's Connor been doing, um, he's created all kinds of articles and books and publishing and uh, created this whole movement really. And has, uh, yeah, has brought some, a lot of really cool principles to light. Now, to be completely honest, I am so non-political. I, I know so very little about that, that space and about the Constitution. This is so embarrassing that I say this. But... Uh, Which is another requirement. Like, aren't actors supposed to be, like, super political and always, like, spouting off on political... That seems to be a thing these days. I, I, don't know. I, I, think, I, I think I need to now. But uh, <laughs> anyway, um, it, it was, it, it's been really interesting to, to learn. And, and I think a part of one of the reasons why... I never got into it, which is not a very good reason at all, is, was I just remember my, um, my dad, who was like, he's very political, and he's uh, very much a Democrat. He would just get into so many arguments. I remember when I was a kid, like just like, you know, people kind of bashing each other and stuff. And I think I just associated politics with just negativity and conflict and argument. 
And right. I, I was like, mm, I'd rather not be a part of that. Sure. And so I kind of just n never really got overly interested in it. But, but I love the stuff that you're doing though, Connor, and um, I'd love to learn more. And so, um, yeah, tell me a little bit about your journey. Like after, after our kind of our roommate phase, our roommate days to where yeah. you're now. Right, right when we were uh, roommates is when blogging really kind of exploded, yeah. like 2004, 2005, it was like, you know, if, if you were, you know, gonna make a name for yourself, you had a blog. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I set up a blog. And what's funny is I remember my journey going through public school, and, co and even college as well. And it wasn't until after I graduated college, where all of a sudden, I had like all this time on my hands. And I had this like mental energy that previously, right, I'm like tests and assignments and yeah. projects and having to cram information in my head. But when I graduated college and, uh, and I moved to Lehigh, I found myself like I had time for intellectual curiosity, right? Like I had time to just read what I wanted to read. And yeah, like I had weekends and, you know, spare time during school, but, but like the academic side of my brain couldn't handle like what I got to read like these 18 books for all my classes. And then I'm going to read another book that of stuff I, you know, really want to learn about on this other thing. No. Right. So it wasn't until after I graduated where I started reading books on the constitution, on economics, American history, and really start developing an interest. And so along the way I started blogging because I'm like, Hey, here's what I'm learning. And I want to share this with other people. And I gained kind of a, a readership. People started reading. And what's funny about that is, I quickly realized how awful I wrote. Like when I go back and read my early blog posts, I like cringe, right? Cause I'm like, Ugh. like yeah. that, I, I said those things and I wrote that way. So it forced me to very quickly real, uh, learn how to write well, to make persuasive arguments, to avoid, you know, logical fallacies and stuff like that. And uh, things just kind of escalated as, as things commonly do, uh, you know, one thing leads to another and kind of go line upon line blogging led to uh, networking networking led to writing my first book writing my first book led to uh, getting more involved politically because it was a book about why members of our faith uh, should be libertarian why why uh, the gospel of christ is uh, meshes well with the philosophy of individual liberty and personal responsibility so anyways that led to networking opportunities um, and, and political opportunities, and then kind of just dovetailed into me seeing a void in Utah where we live mm. to uh, having someone who's like a voice for freedom, who's actually not just writing about it. Cause it's, it's one thing to just like blog about what your opinions are. Anyone can, especially nowadays with social media, like opinions are all over the place. And there's, to your point, contention, like, like crazy. <clears throat> My wife just texted me this morning and, and she's been engaging in kind of a local community Facebook group about all these shutdowns and everything happening and just expressing her views diplomatically that, you know, maybe we ought not to be calling the cops on other people just because they're playing soccer out on the field and you think they ought to be, you know, quarantined at home. Let's not call the cops. And someone accused her this morning of being a Holocaust denier. Like what? randomly and out of the blue. Right. So it's stuff like that where people are like, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to deal with that. So I'm just going to disengage. I completely understand people who take that path such as yourself yeah. because for, for so many people uh, it very much is like, it's just a source of contention and yeah, I don't it, quite know it, what I believe. So why bother? Yeah. It's a source of contention. And I, I think the, the biggest thing for me was I'm a truth seeker. I've always felt like I've been a truth seeker. I, you know, like, um, from a spiritual point of view, like my seeking for truth has led me to the spiritual beliefs that I have, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I've, and I know they work for me and they're, and they've been amazing and it's been awesome, but I've always felt like I've been a truth seeker. And the problem is, is in the world of politics, I don't know what's true. Mm -hmm. you know? And that really, um, it, it really kind of makes me cringe a little bit because um, I feel like when I, can find truth and and grasp onto it and like just like really lean into it like it just it, it makes me come alive i guess that's the way to put it is like yeah. truth makes me come alive and and i get excited by it and stuff and when i hear the different sides and the different arguments and the and them trying to be persuasive and and whatnot and the media sharing whatever it decides to share and yeah. obviously it has its own perspective and its own agendas yep i i listen and i'm like i just don't feel the truth and it kind of like made me to this point where I'm like, mm, 
I kind of want to like, not like I want to run away or be ignorant, but it's more of a, I just want to observe, if that makes sense. I just want to observe what's being said, but not necessarily take a side because I don't know where to even put my beliefs And, and that's what I think is tough is oftentimes it's presented as sides, right? You're with us or you're against us. It's left and right. It's us versus them. And, and that I think it, not only is it intentional, it's also destructive. It's also inaccurate because like you, I, I consider myself a truth seeker. And I believe that in so-called politics, there are fundamental principles. Those are the truths. Um, you know, the Declaration of Independence, uh, we hold these truths to be uh, self-evident, right? Life, liberty, property rights, pursuit of happiness, stuff like that. So it, it's one thing to say, you know, did uh, Saddam Hussein have weapons of mass destruction, yes or no? Or was the coronavirus manufactured in a Chinese lab because they want to destroy America? Yes, like who knows, right? We lack access to information. So then you get all these like talking heads claiming based on limited information. That, that to me is like, a, like the superficial level up here of just, you know, based on misinformation. Misinformation, disinformation. And like your mind deciding to like kind of fill in the gaps when it doesn't know what it is. Right. And, and you and I are like, we lack the, the military intelligence to know what's what, or we don't know what happened in Congress on this day. So how do we make a, a, an informed opinion about yeah. something? That's something different in my mind where I try and focus on and where our, our organization is always trying to advocate is on those underlying principles that ap apply to any issue at any time, right? Like I have the right to free speech. And so when the government, uh, whether it's Republican, Democrat, local government, national government, when anyone's trying to violate that, that's when I think we can stand on that true principle and say, well, wait a minute, I, I have this inherent right and that you're now trying to violate that right. I don't like that. I want to do something about it. Here, here's the example I often share. Yeah. If your neighbor starts to spread his you know, junk on your lawn and kind of slowly, day by day, inch by inch, he's moving a little further. You don't have a fence, right? So he's just kind of encroaching a little more, a little more. If you don't know where that property boundary is, you will not know how to stop his advance, right? You don't know yeah. when to tell him, well, wait a minute, you crossed the line. And yeah. so that's the challenge that I see from, um, from basically is like a societal perspective uh, where if we collectively don't know what our rights are and if we don't know when, they're, when the line is being crossed, when they're being violated, we're never going to be able to defend them. And so from my vantage point, looking over the years, we've lost collectively a lot of freedoms. There's been a lot more regulation, a yeah. lot more growth of government. And it's that encroachment where someone like me who kind of feels like I know where those rights are, I know where those boundaries are, you're stepping over the line. But everyone else is just like, oh, you're good, you know, spread that junk over there, it's fine. Um, I still got enough here on my lawn, I'm good. But they don't realize that, you know, it's like the camel's nose in the tent, right? Every little inch and inch and inch and it moves forward. So that's something that I feel very passionate about is making sure yeah. that, um, you know, we're, we even publish like these children's books to try and do this, is to try and teach these principles that apply whether you're in America or you're in Ecuador, or, you know, uh -huh. Mongolia or whatever, because I, I feel like as humans, we have these innate God-given rights. Mm -hmm. Those are the true principles. Uh, I, I'm with you, all the contention and the bickering back and forth and the tribalism and in, in politics yeah. and the contention. It's really just something that I think we can all just kind of discard. But I think it is important for all of us to at least know where those boundaries are and make sure that we're kind of uh, defensive of them. Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting to me because um, I guess in, in different terms, I've, I've said this before, but like I've noticed uh, in circumstances like when I'm making films or when I'm doing certain shows and stuff, something feels off. I'm like, oh my gosh, what, 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 what is happening? What, why? And it takes me a couple of days before I realize, oh, um, I don't have power in me, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I feel like I've given my power away and something else is ruling over me. And I see this in the acting business all the time because honestly, like in LA, you can go and you're auditioning and you're doing all these different things, but you really are kind of a puppet to, sure. to somebody else's um, game plan, if you will. Sure. And you either fit that game plan or you don't fit that game plan, right? You, no matter how well you do or whatever. And so, it, I always felt this this thing of like, oh, I've got to perform well, and now the casting director who's over me can kind of like decide, and now it's a producer, right? And it's like, I felt like my voice was being taken away. Sure. 
Um, but I realized, okay, well, I have developed skills as an actor and I have booked some really cool shows. So why don't I just create my own show? Why don't I create my own show and I can keep my own voice? And I think that's one of the reasons why I like creating my own show because it's, it's my voice. I can feel it. Yeah. But whenever I am a part of any organization or anything where it's like, give your power away to us to rule over you. I, I, there's something in me that just kind of rubbed me the wrong way. I'm just like, nope, this does not feel right. This does not feel good, you know? And I mean, I, I get it. Like there's some, there's some situations where maybe I don't know the best thing and maybe it's like, okay, well, I, I would love some guidance. I would love to, to learn. But, um, but that, that's like kind of me, like willingly giving my, in a sense, quote unquote power. It's like, hey, cool. Like, let me learn from you, you know, let me do that. Whereas there's certain situations I'm assuming in the government where it's like you never voluntarily gave those rights away, you know. I think it's 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 so interesting what you're saying because once you achieve independence, yeah. it's so hard to be dependent again, right? Like sure. I, I remember I remember when I went to BYU and I'm off living on my own. I have this distinct memory yeah. uh, of this family vacation we went on after I was a, I was a junior in college. So I had been out on my own. I had gone home for Christmas or whatever, but we're on this family vacation over summer together and I'm the oldest of four boys. And I remember being on this vacation where I, I see myself now as an adult and I'm living independently, but now I'm back with my family yes. and I'm paying for things and I'm doing stuff on their time. And I found myself mentally falling back into that kind of teenage vibe of like bickering with my brothers, complaining against my parents being bossed around, bristling against what I'm told. And it was so interesting as I look back, because I'm like, you, you, you achieve a little bit of independence or whatever, and then you go back to some dependence, and I didn't like it at all. Mm -hmm. And I think that now, like I, I lead my own organization. We've got a dozen people working with us. Um, I'm kind of the boss calling the shots. The idea of me going to work for someone else, like, ugh, you know, I, 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 would, I would struggle with that because I, I, like you, right? I don't want to answer to someone else, be a cog in someone else's machine. And, and here's where I think the time is for kind of politics and freedom and everything else. You know, you look at people, uh, I mean, think of, uh, you know, slavery here in America. There was a, a law called the Fugitive Slave Act, okay. a federal law that said that if a slave escaped from the South, that anyone who saw that slave was required by law and punished uh, if they violated it, they were required to return that slave to its supposed master. And, mm -hmm. and I put myself in the mindset of people who had finally escaped slavery. They're making their way on the Underground Railroad. They're going north. And all of a sudden, they're being returned to that environment of enslavement where they were supposed to go. Like, I can't even fathom what that would be like to experience independence and then return to being dependent. So it's something that, like, even just financial independence, right? I think it's so important that we... As, as, as families and individuals be trying to figure out how to plan for our retirement, be yeah. having savings. Cause look at right now, what's happening right now. There's some uh, instability or not some, there's a lot of instability in the economy and all these businesses are like shutting down. People who are living paycheck to paycheck are, are just screwed. They're defaulting on rent. There's all these consequences. Why? In large part, because people were not independent. They were dependent on a system, paycheck to paycheck, week to week, that, look, I can't live and subsist without this, so that when there's a disruption, all of a sudden that causes them a lot of harm. Whereas those who were a bit independent, even if it's only partially, right? I, maybe I listen to Dave Ramsey. I've got my six months of you know, savings or whatever. But that helps you weather the storm where you can act rather than being acted upon. Yeah. which I think is just so critical. Wink, wink, right? Some of us. Yeah. Which I'll tell you, it's funny because working in politics in Utah, people will drop these little one-liners that I'm like, I, I know. I got doing. you. I got you. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I think the principle is valid, right? Even if you're a member of our faith or not, that, that the ability, like I'll use myself as an example. I had a few extra rolls of toilet paper. So when the toilet paper crisis happened and the stores were empty, I could help, literally did help someone who was just out of toilet paper. They couldn't find any. That's a small, stupid example. But yeah. being able kind of to be independent in that regard and be able to be of service to someone else, it was not only confidence for me that like, oh, it's okay. The stores yeah. don't have toilet paper right now. We'll get through this. But I could also help someone else. So that was just a very 
satisfying thing for me. And I think it has just a very uh, like much broader application in our lives about trying to achieve that independence yeah. for our own satisfaction and, and security and so forth, but also to be of assistance to others. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, it's so, it's such a, it's such a joy to, to experience abundance, you know, for yourself, because uh, hopefully you're, that, that abundance can go to, to being shared with other people, you know, and you're able to empower other people. I mean, who would have thought that toilet paper, something so simple as toilet paper would be something that could actually help someone else out? Well, in a situation like we're, what we're facing right now, it absolutely can be, yeah. right? Yeah. So I'd love to like discuss a little bit more about um, some of your general principles of your institute. Like, how did it get started? And, and what do you, uh, for lack of a better term, like, what do you, what do you believe? Like, what are you, what are you teaching? And what, what does your literature teach? And how can people become more involved and educated? So, you know, I believe in freedom. And basically everyone else will claim, you know, the same thing. No one's gonna be like, I hate freedom. You know, that sounds awful, right? Huh. But, but I, I, I absolutely believe it. I, I believe that uh, we um, are children of God. And whether you believe in God or not, if it's just we as individuals and humans have human rights and um, government uh, is basically an organization that, that we create to do things together that we can't do alone. Um, mm -hmm. But it is the creature. Uh, it's not the creator. What I mean by that is we as individuals predate government, right? We, we yeah. kind of were born outside of it. Yeah. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like um, we created the government almost as a tool to assist us. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so think of it like AI, right? There's always this like fear yeah. of AI is going to like, end up controlling humanity like the matrix and enslave us all that that's how a lot of people like me see the government where rather than it being our creature it often kind of becomes uh bigger than we ever intended it to be and rather than serving us it ends up controlling us and so um you know i believe that i have the right to do anything that i want peaceably as long as i'm not harming another person if i want to use marijuana and I'm not driving, and I'm not giving it to kids, and I'm just sitting in my basement, I think I have that right. I don't think the government can tell me not to. I think that I have the right to uh, rent my basement out to someone else, because as long as I'm not bothering my neighbors, they're not blaring music at 3 a.m., there's not 80 cars on the road, whatever, whatever, right? But so often through government, we try and control other people's behavior we, we get together and we're like, nah, we're not going to do short-term rentals in, in this community. You know, we, we want to ban it in our city or no, marijuana should be illegal. We're just going to arrest and put people in prison who, who use this plant. So it's stuff like that. Uh, the very simple way to uh, think about this is um, because government is us, yeah. because it is our creature, we can't empower that creature. We can't delegate authority to it that we don't have, right? I, I can, uh, government is basically our agent. We're saying, you know what? I have the right to defend myself. So, hey, government, we all want you to defend us on our behalf. So we have police and we have the military, right? Mm -hmm. um, we have these pre-existing rights. And then we say, hey, government, we're, we're creating you to exercise these rights on our behalf. I don't have the right to tell, you know, my neighbor that his daughter can't have a lemonade stand on their driveway right? Or he can't build a shed in his backyard or finish his basement without paying money to me to, you know, so I can't ask the government to do this on my behalf. I yeah. can't go to the government and say, you know, hey, I want you to boss this guy around because because I don't have that right. So how can I in good good faith and, and, and to be moral, how can I ask the government to do to my neighbor what I am unable and unwilling to do myself. If my neighbor is smoking pot in his basement, do I, am I really going to go bark, bang down his door and pull him out of there and lock him in a cage? Like I would never think to do that stuff. So how can I ask someone else to do it on my behalf? I'm a very religious person. I, I think that we ought to consider uh, the, the commandment of loving one another, mm -hmm. that it's not just about you know, doing that in church, or it's not about just bringing baked goods to our neighbors and, you know, pulling their weeds. I think that extends to all of our interactions yeah. with one another. And so am I loving someone else? Am I loving my neighbor when I'm controlling them through the government? I, I voted in November, 
or I supported raising taxes on them and taking more of their money because I want to park in our city. And so I'm going to vote to raise taxes on everyone else. Am I, am I loving my neighbor if I'm saying, I'm going to force you through government to do these things? Mm. So really it comes down to, I'm a big proponent in voluntary interactions, in persuading people to do good, to agree with me, to support causes I believe in. I'm a strong opponent to forcing other people to do what I think they should or what I want them to do for me. Um, And so basically libertarianism, if you want to call it that, uh, I like to call it uh, voluntarism, doing things voluntarily. Uh, Frankly, in a religious context, I like to call it Christianity because I see myself trying to live out in the public square the principles that I privately believe Mm -hmm. uh, that God has commanded us to do. I don't have a church bucket and then a politics bucket, right? I try and say, I I believe God wants us to act this way to one another. And, and, you know, that has application in government. We can't just say, oh, we can set aside what we learned on Sunday and we can just go beat people up and lock them up and send them to kill other people and all these kind of things. No, I, I think, I think all of that has to be informed by these moral, true principles um, that's, so my first book, it was Latter-day Liberty, where I tried to say like, okay, what does our faith actually say as it pertains to government and politics? Uh, but beyond that, like, these are true principles that apply to people of any faith or no faith. And so our, our organization, it's, you know, non-partisan, it's certainly non-religious, but it's an attempt to say, how can we change the laws and educate the public in a way that leads us more in that direction? Yeah. Well, let me ask you, like, you know, you said you've written, you've written a couple of children's books, right? And yeah. you're, when I help people learn at an early age, which I probably should have been reading uh, now. <laughs> but um, it's, do you find that um, as people read your literature and stuff, like what have, what have uh, people said about it? Like, have they resonated well with the, with the principles that you've been teaching? Oh, it's, it's been just amazing. This project kind of started by accident. Let me tell very quickly the backstory. Yeah, tell me. Yeah, I'm, okay. I am running this organization, like fighting for freedom and changing these laws and whatever. And I'd come home to my kids and at the time they were five and three. So they were still yeah. pretty and I'd, I'd find myself wanting to share with them like what I did all day, right? Like I'd ask them, what, what do you do? And oh, I colored this and I played with, you know, so-and-so. Yeah. And I'd find myself like, crap, how do I explain like eminent domain? Like we're fighting against this law right now that lets the government take people's property. Yeah. Uh, and there's this guy whose farm was being taken by the government because his neighbors wanted to turn it into a park. So they're basically stealing this family farm yeah. And I think that's wrong. And yeah. we're trying to fight to stop it. How do I talk to a five year old about that? You know? So I was struggling. And, uh, you know, when, when your parents of a little kid, like one of the easiest things when you're talking about a sensitive subject, say like the birds and the bees yeah. is you go on Amazon and you find a book that helps, right? Like yeah. Here, let's read this fun story. And, and now I can like c- explain these, you know, controversial or sensitive subjects to you. So I went on Amazon trying to figure out like, hey, are there any books out there to talk to kids about like freedom and the constitution and property rights and, and stuff like that and uh, couldn't find anything. And yeah. I spent a couple of weeks being kind of bummed. I'm like, ah, oh, you know, I wish there was something. And then I realized like, you dolt, you know, you talk about entrepreneurship all the time. Here's an opportunity, like why not, you know? Anyways, so that's when the Tuttle Twins was born. And, uh, and so the Tuttle Twins books are an attempt to help uh, young kids learn the way the world works, to learn the ideas of a free society. And so we've got now, gosh, we've got 11 books in the series. They're all, they're each about 60 pages. Okay. I don't have any next to me here. Um, oh, here's one right here, hang on. So these are all, uh, so they're all fully illustrated. Awesome. They're about 60 pages. Yeah. And, um, and they got a bit of text in there and they just talk about all these ideas. So this one's all about education, how we, how we learn um, the best way and, and, and so forth. So yeah. they're super fun. And, um, you know, we've done this now for five years. We've sold over half a million copies. Wow, man. That's uh, amazing. Yeah. It's been incredible. I mean, right now there's so many people at home, like homeschooling, you know, because their kids are... Wow 
trapped at home. And, and so sales have been actually going up lately because there's so many people just like, I want, we need but more books to read and I want my kids to learn these ideas. And the hard part is like schools don't teach any of this stuff. Right. The, yeah. Yeah. I don't remember learning a lot of this stuff when I was in school, you know, in fact, the, the biggest, um, point of feedback or comment that we get from parents on like social media and stuff or emailing us is usually the moms, but sometimes we'll get, you know, the dads too, but mostly it's the moms reading this stuff with the kids. These moms time and time and time again, will say, I'm learning all this stuff for the first time along my kids about how economies work and why money is the way it is. Yeah. And, how to be an entrepreneur and you know, the golden rule and all these different things that we talk about in the books. And uh, that's super gratifying because we're not only talking to the kids about this stuff, we're also talking about the adults. And uh, the, 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 the thing I love the most is like what we've seen over the years doing this. Basically, like you think of your average dinner conversation with a, a kid, like, what did you do today? And how was your day? Uh, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, and what's fun about these books is it really, I think, helps a lot of parents level up those conversations. Like, let's talk about real things. Yeah. Our, our latest book is all about, for example, bailouts, which are happening right now in our. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Stimulus, which is happening right now. Uh, we talk about interest rates. And it sounds super boring, but these are all in the context of a fun story where we kind of drop these little nuggets. So we talk about interest rates. Well, right now the interest rates are at zero. So uh, what does that actually mean? And is that sustainable? And what's happened in past countries when they drop the interest rate like that? We talk about messing up the market and the harm that that can cause people. That's happening right now. So mm -hmm. it's crazy because um, all these families now have this these books where they can communicate to their kids about what's happening in the world and help them make sense of all the stuff that's happening. Whereas oftentimes I would feel otherwise as a parent, like, Oh no, it's fine. It's fine. These are adult things. Don't worry about it. Things will, you know, but now I can sit down with my kid and help them actually understand all this stuff that's happening, give yeah. them confidence, reassure them about, you know, look in history, this has happened time and again, we'll get through this. There'll be some pain. There'll be, some change, but you know, we'll get through this together. And I just think that's a, a fun thing for a parent to be able to offer that to, to your kids. Dude, that is fantastic, man. I mean, it's, I think that's a really, really cool, um, a cool, a cool tool, a cool, edu a cool educational tool. And um, yeah, something that can empower people, something that can really help them to understand in very basic terms. I mean, I think that's one of the other problems with me is sometimes when I, if I want to jump in, everything looks so daunting, you know, the world looks yeah. so like overwhelming and I'm like, I don't even know where to begin. I don't know where to start. And so I, I, I am a little apprehensive. Right. But, but the title twins seem like my kind of reading, you know, so, honestly, for like for sure for all these parents, that's what we hear. We, we, you know, it's one thing to give them this thick book of like, here's how you can learn what economics is, or here's where you can learn. Like yeah. no parent is going to, few parents are going to want to pick up this like dry book that, right. And so, Hey parent, here's a short fun story that you can read with your kids. It's just a very low barrier to entry for even the adults who are just like, I might be intimidated by all, you know, the original works and, and yeah. the, you know, books, but now I can read a fun story with my kids and we can learn about it together. So it's just it's awesome. a ton of fun. And I've got this whole like policy side of what we do and changing all these laws and stuff. And then this totally different yeah. project that and yeah. it just keeps things interesting. And, and are you, I, the, are you the author? Like do you write I'm them? Author. Yeah. I write all the books. Wow. And so, um, you know, I just like it because I feel like we're serving so many people back to the toilet paper example, right? I just love being able to, to benefit uh, people and have them, you know, be actually positively benefited in their lives in some way. And so it's yeah. created such a good outlet to, we're not just out there changing laws and spouting off our ideas. We're actually helping these families have these meaningful conversations, help parents teach their kids, help people have more confidence in the world to understand why things are happening the way they do. So it's just, it's honestly a lot of fun. That's awesome, man. Well, I'm, I'm stoked for you. Like this, that's, that, that's amazing. You know, I had like this thought that came to my mind. Um, you know, you talked about when you're in school, when the kids were in school, you never learned these type of things. Yeah. I, no, I certainly didn't. But from like a weird, like an interesting perspective, you were saying like, we don't want to give the creature 
power to rule over us, right? right. We are the creator, that's the creature, right? And, yep. and it, it was meant to be a tool that we can use to like help better our lives. But like the moment that it has more power than us, then we kind of succumb and we kind of fall and, and all yeah. these things. Well, I, I think from in even like certain perspective of like just life, I have seen how, um, like think about just the human mind, like what a beautiful tool it is and how the, this tool can be used to do some amazing, awesome things. But I've also seen how if you kind of let your mind take over and you, you, let, you let the mind fill with its own ideas and its own stories, it sometimes controls us. I know that sounds kind of weird, but it's like I, I've seen so many people, myself included, that get stuck in these false narratives in their minds. And that, that narrative starts like speaking for them and they start seeing life through that narrative, whatever that narrative is, right? And so I think in, in a weird way, like trying to gain that power back to yourself and trying to see things clearly is always the way to go for me anyway. And um, I love like, that's what your whole thing is about because I, even though I've been probably very, um, what's the word, apprehensive, a little bit nervous, like, like understanding the world of politics, maybe because of all these negative associates, uh, negative associations I've had with it. Yeah. I'm actually very interested in learning about um, what you've been doing and, and about the Tuttle Twins and all that stuff. So, where do you go from here? Like, what is the, what's the mission? What's the whole hope? Uh, what do you want to do? That's a great question. So, um, I mean, the short version of all of it is, you know, we're, we're a state-based organization. Yeah. And, um, so we uh, focus just here in Utah and on like city and state issues. But I get so many messages from people like, hey, are you going to open a chapter in our state? And we, you know, we need work here. And so what we're looking to do is start to expand our work into other states and figure out how to uh, make change elsewhere. On, on our laws, uh, like I think our track record is 82% of all of our proposals are enacted into law. So we've kind of developed a pretty good track record in terms of going to uh, change things and defend people's rights and fix laws that are uh, you know, burdening businesses too much or causing families problems and so forth. So we've got kind of this good machine going that after seven, eight years, we've been able to uh, get, you know, running and humming. And so uh, the Tuttle Twins books are doing really well. Uh, for us, it's really just about what are the problems out there that people are having? What, what um, regulations are preventing an entrepreneur from, you know, innovating? Like here, I remember last year, just to give you an example of kind of what we do more specifically, um, there was a, a uh, there's a company called Turo and they're like Airbnb, but for cars. So oh. you can share your car online and say, yeah, for, you know, 80 bucks a day, you can drive my car. And uh, so you go on the app and put your, you know, Hey, I'm traveling to Dallas. Um, I want to rent a car. Ooh, sports car, you know, $120 a day. Sure. I'll rent it for, it's like rent car rentals, but directly from people rather than just like Airbnb is you're not going to a hotel, you're doing it directly with people and it has its pluses and some people like it. So anyways, in Salt Lake city, they had this law that had been on the books for like 30, 40 years, something like that, uh, prohibiting this type of thing. Mm. And so here comes Turo and they launch and all these people are doing it. Well, all these people would fly into the Salt Lake City Airport and they get out and they meet a cop. Like, like a mat. how's that for a welcome mat to our friendly yeah. state, right? <laughs> Here's your ticket and we're writing up the guy whose car it is and you're all getting busted and now you got to go figure out some other mode of transportation. So that, that's an example where like we're big free market people. We love all these new apps and services and things coming out, uh, just serving people, connecting people to one another getting them the goods and services that they need and individually if you think of like DoorDash and Grubhub, right now that the restaurants are shut down, they can still thrive because we have these apps that allow them to kind of deliver and so forth. So our organization does two things. We, we kind of share, you know, these problems like, Hey, look, we have identified this. Here's what we need to yeah. do about it. Here are the principles involved of, you know, why we think this ought to be fixed. And then we set up campaigns to actually go get those laws changed. And so okay. we've got relationships with elected officials and we can go try and change the law to, to fix that issue, but then prevent it, you know, from happening in the future. So that's what a lot of our work is, is hearing from people in the community about like, Hey, this regulator came after me or this law prevents me from doing this, or I had to pay this crazy amount of money to get this permit. And I think that's wrong. And so people are always just reaching out to us with their experiences and they need help. 
and they don't know how to solve it. They just know that they got this letter in the mail. We had one guy in St. George who was renting his basement on Airbnb. Yeah. Turns out it was against the law. He didn't know that. He just signed up on Airbnb and thought yeah, this would be fun. His kids loved it. They met so many interesting people. They actually lived two doors down from the mayor. And, and he had no clue that they were doing it because, again, they weren't having like a negative impact on. Yeah, yeah. Stuff. Yet they get this letter in the mail saying, you need to shut down or we're finding you hundreds of dollars a day from now on if you don't stop. And he's like, but who have I harmed? Who am I bothering? Yeah. Why does anyone care? And so that's an example where people like that who experience a problem have an organization that they can reach out to. And we have the resources and the connections and so forth to actually try and do something about it. Um, and, and try and help people like that and help other people who we don't know, but who are having like similar issues and, and they don't know to reach out to us or who we even are. And so it's really just kind of a service minded approach where we're always just on the hunt for, you know, what, what, what are the challenges people are facing? And then uh, how can we go get things fixed to help solve their problems? So that's kind of yeah. at the end of the day, what we're trying to do. We kind of see ourselves as, as uh, you know, the Gandalf uh right we're, we're the guide and so everyone's on their own journey right like everyone's a hero in their own story but we're trying to be the guide and say let's help point you in the right direction we can get you past those hurdles we know how to overcome them we want you to continue your journey you've got to go through the you know ring and mount doom yep we want to help you along the way just to make sure that you can kind of get there all the way to the end and so yeah. we're a liberty-minded Gandalf, or you know morpheus to your neo kind of thing right we're the, yeah. we're the helping yeah. hand when you need it yeah for sure dude well i i love it man I, and i love what you guys are doing and i'm excited to to jump into the tunnel twins um uh i guess one kind of final question connor with all of the stuff you're doing the situation is kind of crazy right now right with with COVID yeah. and everything what advice would you give to people and even by people, I mean, just even yourself, like what have you been doing right now to kind of maintain a sense of purpose and joy? Because a lot of people are, are struggling right now. Right. And um, they're trying to find their purpose. They're trying to find what they want to do. What would you, what would you say to them? It's a great question. Um, the first thing I would think is we can't really find purpose or joy. Well, if we're scared, uh, the, the human mind is really interesting. I actually wrote a book uh, a few years ago called Feardom, and it was all about how our fear can control us and how other people can control us based on our fear. And, and so when we're scared, it's more easy to be, uh, again, to be acted upon. We are not good at acting to find that purpose and that joy. We're not good at acting if we're, we're scared. We turn very insular. And so the first thing is, I see a lot of people out there who are scared. There's every reason to be scared. A lot of people are suffering, whether, you know, the few who are suffering for health reasons or the many who are suffering for economic reasons. Um, part of what I have confidence in is, look, is learning from history, right? There are always going to be challenges. Um, but if you look back through history, I think it gives you confidence that we're going to get through this. And again, it will be more painful for some and it'll be very painful for you know a few others but um but we're gonna get through it and so freaking out and overreacting and everything i think is unproductive um and so i think just having a bit of confidence like look this this is gonna blow over we're, we're, we're not gonna be under quarantine forever we're gonna be able to go out and shake hands again and yeah. you know go to parties again so first of all i think is just having that confidence that we're gonna get through this and the second thing i think for purpose and joy is being very introspective uh, right now and giving some time to yourself to figure out how can I be leveraging this kind of transition period to prepare for what's to come. I've seen people set up new e-commerce businesses. Mm -hmm. I've seen people working on writing books. I've seen people developing like comedy sketches and mm -hmm. shows and stuff like that saying, you know, I'm going to come out swinging. And when, when, you know, I've seen, I've seen all kinds of people like using this to say, all right, when we're kind of through this phase, I want to be this better, even family stuff, right? Like, Hey, we're doing these mini staycations now and we're being very purposeful about creating family memories so that we can look back on this period of time, not with, you know, disgust and depression or whatever, but as like, man, we were able to use that to level up together as a family and find more joy together. I think there's a silver lining, you know, in, in all the clouds that are there. And 
a lot of this, I think, as you would agree, is our attitude, and that's what we can control. And uh, if we let ourselves be acted upon, it's very easy to just join everyone else and be negative and upset and fearful and everything else. But if we're intentional about making sure we have a good attitude, I think we can actually be very strategic about uh, coming out of the other side of this, leveraging opportunities, serving other people, uh, being happier and more fulfilled. Um, it's very tough what we're going through, but I, I think any challenge is also an opportunity and, and I'm failing at it, but I'm trying to see all these struggles that we're having over these weeks as there are, you know, opportunities out there that I can try and identify and leverage. And, and so that's what I would offer. No, that's, that's beautiful, man. I mean, here's the deal. One of the biggest things I feel like I've gotten out of this conversation is the idea uh, to act rather than being acted upon. Right. And, um, and I feel like I have, I, I feel like I've, um, you know, you can't do everything, but you can pick one or two things that you're like, this is what I want to focus on. This is what I want to do and, and yeah. just kind of jump in and, and go for it. But it's been interesting. I've, I've, so I started this little web series for fun called going the social distance, you know, and it was just, just talking to people and hearing about their journey and, and, and learning from them. And it's been so beneficial. I've learned a lot from it, but what's been very cool is the the positive effect it's had on other people as well um and i've been really amazed at like how many people have like reached back to me like hey keep going this is amazing yeah Here's the deal. i have no end game in mind i have uh, other than spreading joy other than spreading light some knowledge uh i have no specific like oh i have to achieve this but i don't care i think that's the beautiful thing about it is like i i feel like if you can find something for yourself and you're like I can do that and I can act and do that right now and kind of go for it. I think that right there gives you your power back, you know? And, um, and when, once you get that power back, joy follows immediately. But when we give our power away into fear and to all of those things, then, um, then yeah, we'll just be kind of caught up in a storm and we won't know how to get out of it. So I think that's exactly right. When I'm able to share the extra toilet paper I had, I felt joy in that yeah. moment. Yeah, I can help, right? When I serve these families and they tell me the amazing conversation that they have with their five-year-old, I feel joy. Those are very meaningful, positive things. And so I, I'm a big believer, I guess, yeah, here's our kind of hashtag act or be acted upon uh, theme for yeah. the the, the conversation here, right? But, uh, but yeah, when we can act, when we can be proactive and serve other people, whether that's serving them through your business, you're making them, you yeah. know, meals and they're paying you and it's just a restaurant, but you're really serving your customers. It's yeah. called customer service for a reason. Yeah. Um, when, when we do those acts of service and help one another, whether fin like commercially or spiritually or socially, um, I think that's where joy lies and we all, uh, profit and build wealth and happiness as a result and so i'm i'm just a big believer and and again i i think for all the struggles we're having and all the lingering economic impact there's going to be um, you look back through history even during wars where people are being killed obviously there are huge problems for those affected but for the wider world uh, there's also a lot of opportunities that come out that i think we need to be trying to identify and not just for you know to make some money or to you know momentary satisfaction, but uh, to solve problems, to say, I, I can do something about that. I want to do something about that. I've been equipped and prepared to go fix that. I want to lend my talents and my time to go do that. There's going to be plenty of opportunities for all the problems we're having to go serve people. And uh, I, you know, again, whether professionally or, or personally, um, but I yeah. think the more we adopt that mindset, the happier we're going to be. Man, I wish there was a, a job, uh, for, for just spreading joy. I guess, I guess there is, I guess just creating content that creates joy because I feel like that's my calling in life, you know? Awesome. Uh, sometimes I have excessive amounts, amounts of joy and I'm like, oh my gosh, what do I do with this? What do I do with this? You know? <laughs> so you're not bottling it up and selling it with a custom link and coupon code at the end of this video or anything. I really should be. I really should be. If you can figure something out, that would be amazing. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, Connor, I, I appreciate your time. I know you're a very busy guy. So thanks for, uh, it, you know, thanks for jumping on and chatting with me. And of course, like, you know, it's always fun to reconnect with a former roommate. Sure. You know, yeah, it's been super fun to be on. And I've loved a lot of these videos you're doing. So I'll join the, the crowd and say, keep it up. This has been a awesome. lot of fun to, to participate in, but then also watch the other videos too. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Connor. I really appreciate you taking the time. Okay. Have a good one. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.